Hi, my name is Ted O'Connell, and I'm the author of USMLE Step 2 Secrets. This is part two of our cardiology chapter. We'd like to invite you to subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel and to visit us at medicalschoolvideos.com to see all of the other videos that we have available. And if you have questions or comments or would like to be involved in this project, please email us at step2secrets at gmail.com. First question. Describe the etiology and classic history of the various heart valve abnormalities. Mitral stenosis presents as a late diastolic blowing murmur best heard at the apex. Other findings include an opening snap, a loud S1, atrial fibrillation, left atrial enlargement, and pulmonary hypertension. Mitral regurgitation presents as a holosystolic murmur that radiates to the axilla. Other findings include a soft S1, left atrial enlargement, pulmonary hypertension, and left ventricular hypertrophy. Aortic stenosis presents as a harsh systolic ejection murmur that is best heard in the aortic area and that radiates to the carotids. Other findings include a slow pulse upstroke, S3 or S4 heart sounds, an ejection click, left ventricular hypertrophy, cardiomegaly, syncope, angina, and heart failure. Aortic regurgitation presents as an early diastolic decrescendo murmur that is best heard at the apex. Other findings include widened pulse pressure, left ventricular hypertrophy, left ventricular dilatation, and an S3 heart sound. Mitral prolapse presents as a mid-systolic click and a late systolic murmur. Other findings may include panic disorder. What physical examination findings are associated with the various heart valve abnormalities? For mitral stenosis, Rheumatic fever is the most common etiology, and the history may include dyspnea, orthopnea, and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Mitral regurgitation typically results from rheumatic fever or chordate tendine rupture after a myocardial infarction, and the history typically includes fatigue, dyspnea, and orthopnea. Aortic stenosis is typically seen in older adults. Bicuspid or unicuspid valves may appear with symptoms in childhood. The history is usually asymptomatic for years and begins with dyspnea on exertion. It then progresses to angina, syncope, and heart failure, with the mortality rate increasing through this progression. Aortic regurgitation can be remembered with the cream mnemonic. The C and the R are for congenital rheumatic damage, E for endocarditis, A for aortic dissection or aortic root dilatation, and M for Marfan syndrome. In terms of the history, it can present acutely with severe dyspnea, acute pulmonary congestion, and cardiogenic shock, and it can also present chronically with dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea, and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Describe the treatment of each of the aforementioned valvular disorders. Mitral stenosis is a mechanical problem and requires balloon valvotomy or surgery if it becomes severe. Medical management with diuretics, digoxin, and beta blockers is only adjunctive to either percutaneous or surgical intervention. Mitral regurgitation is treated with corrective surgery if certain indications are pre present, such as a flail leaflet or severe regurgitation. Vasodilators such as nitroprusside and hydralazine may be used in symptomatic patients. Atrial fibrillation is common because left atrial enlargement is, is treated with rate control and anticoagulation as appropriate if it is present. Aortic valve replacement should be performed in essentially all patients with symptomatic aortic stenosis. Aortic valve replacement or repair is indicated in symptomatic patients with chronic aortic regurgitation. Aortic valve replacement or repair may be indicated for asymptomatic patients under certain circumstances, such as progressive left ventricular enlargement, along with specific echocardiographic findings that are beyond the scope of the USMLE. Vasodilators may be used to reduce the hemodynamic burden and possibly delay the need for surgery in asymptomatic patients. True or false, an understanding of the pathophysiology behind the various changes associated with long-standing valvular heart disease is high yield for the Step 2 examination. 
true. For example, it is advisable to understand why right side heart failure may occur with long-standing mitral stenosis. This is not memorization, but rather the ability to determine rationally which changes are associated with each type of valvular dysfunction. Who should receive endocarditis prophylaxis? The 2008 American Heart Association recommendations conclude that only an extremely small number of cases of infective endocarditis might be prevented by antibiotic prophylaxis for dental procedures. Cardiac conditions for which prophylaxis before dental procedures is recommended include prosthetic cardiac valve, previous infectious endocarditis, congenital heart disease, and cardiac transplant recipients who develop valvulopathy. Antibiotic prophylaxis is no longer recommended for genitourinary or gastrointestinal procedures. Describe the protocols for endocarditis prophylaxis. An antibiotic for prophylaxis should be administered in a single dose before the procedure. Amoxicillin is a preferred choice for oral therapy. Cephalexin, clindamycin, azithromycin, or clarithromycin may be used in patients with penicillin allergy. Ampicillin, cefazolin, ceftriaxone, or clindamycin may be used for patients unable to take oral medication. What is the Virchow triad? The Virchow triad consists of three findings associated with deep venous thrombosis. These are endothelial damage, venous stasis, and hypercoagulable state. These broad categories should help you remember when to think about the possibility of DVT. List the common clinical scenarios for development of DVT. Surgery, especially orthopedic, pelvic, abdominal, or neurosurgery. Malignancy, trauma, immobilization, pregnancy, the use of birth control pills, disseminated intravascular coagulation, and hypercoagulable states such as factor V Leiden, antithrombin 3 deficiency, protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, prothrombin G20210A gene mutation, hyperhomocysteinemia, or antiphospholipid antibodies. Describe the physical signs and symptoms of DVT. How is it diagnosed? Signs and symptoms include unilateral leg swelling, pain or tenderness, and or a Homan sign, which is only present in 30% of cases. Superficial palpable cords imply superficial thrombophlebitis rather than DVT. DVT is best diagnosed by Doppler compression ultrasonography or impedance plethysmography of the veins of the extremity. The gold standard is venography, but this invasive test is reserved for situations when the diagnosis is not clear. True or false, superficial thrombophlebitis is a risk factor for pulmonary embolus. False. Superficial thrombophlebitis, which presents as erythema, tenderness, edema, and a palpable clot in a superficial vein, affects the superficial veins and does not cause PEs. It is considered a benign condition, although recurrent superficial thrombophlebitis can be a marker for underlying malignancy. For example, Trousseau syndrome or migratory thrombophlebitis is a classic marker for pancreatic cancer. Treat affected patients with NSAIDs and warm compresses. How is DVT treated and for how long? Systemic anticoagulation is necessary. Use intravenous heparin or subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin initially, followed by crossover to oral warfarin. Patients should be maintained on warfarin for at least three to six months, possibly for life if more than one episode of clotting occurs. What is the best way to prevent DVT in patients undergoing surgery? Prophylactic measures for patients undergoing surgery depend on the risk for developing DVT or PE. Early ambulation is recommended for low-risk patients. Low molecular weight heparin, low-dose unfractionated heparin, or fondaparinux is recommended for patients at moderate risk. High-risk patients should be given low molecular, low molecular weight heparin, fondaparinux, or an oral vitamin K antagonist. Alternatively, 
pneumatic compression stocking should be used if the patient is at moderate risk or higher and is at high risk for bleeding. In what clinical settings does PE occur? Describe the symptoms and signs. PE commonly follows DVT, delivery from an amniotic fluid embolus, or fractures from fat emboli. Classically, the patient recently went on a long car ride, took a long airplane flight, or has been immobilized. Symptoms include tachypnea, dyspnea, chest pain, hemoptysis, if a lung infarct has occurred, hypotension, syncope, or death in severe cases. In rare instances, the chest radiograph shows a wedge-shaped wedge defect because of pulmonary infarct. True or false, DVT can lead to a stroke. False, with one rare exception. Embolization of left-sided heart clots because of atrial fibrillation, ventricular wall aneurysm, severe congestive heart failure, or endocarditis causes arterial infarcts, stroke, and renal, GI, or extremity infarcts not PEs. DVTs, or right-sided heart clots that embolize, cause PEs, not arterial emboli. The exception is the patient with a right-to-left shunt, such as a patent fer foramen ovale, atrial or ventricular septal defect, or pulmonary arteriovenous fistula. In such a patient, a venous clot may embolize and cross over to the left side of the circulation, causing an arterial infarct. This event is quite rare. How is PE diagnosed? Use CT pulmonary angiogram or ventilation perfusion scan, the so-called VQ scan, to evaluate for PE. If the test is positive, PE is diagnosed and treatment is started. If the test is indeterminate, a conventional pulmonary angiogram is used to confirm the diagnosis. Conventional pulmonary angiography is a gold standard, but it is invasive and carries substantial risks. If a CT angiogram or VQ scan is negative, it is highly unlikely that the patient has a significant PE, thus no treatment is needed. In the setting of a low probability VQ scan and high clinical suspicion, a CT angiogram or conventional pulmonary angiogram is needed. How is PE treated? PE is treated initially with low molecular weight heparin or IV unfractionated heparin to prevent further clots and emboli. Then the patient switches gradually to oral warfarin, which must be taken for at least three to six months. In patients with recurrent clots on anticoagulation or contraindications to anticoagulation, an inferior vena cava filter should be used. In patients with massive PE, embolectomy, either surgical or catheter embolectomy, or pharmacologic thrombolysis, for example, TPA, may be attempted. That's the end of part two of our cardiology chapter. Please join us next time for part three.